committee will come to order. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we welcome everyone here today, uh, both my colleagues and our distinguished witnesses this afternoon and the folks here who have taken the time to uh, uh, sit through this testimony. Uh, I would also like to extend a special greeting to uh, Chairman Rice and Chairman Smith, who will be here uh, shortly, who will be joining us this afternoon. Uh, it has been a very busy couple of days uh, for issues regarding Vietnam here in Congress. Uh, yesterday, nearly 800 uh, Vietnamese Americans came to a uh, Capitol Hill for the Vietnamese American Advocacy Day uh, to meet with their representatives and discuss the most uh, pressing issues facing the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. And I had the uh, honor and pleasure to address about 350 people in the uh, uh, auditorium of the Capitol Visitor Center yesterday morning, and, and uh, that was a great opportunity to meet quite a few people. Um, I extend a special welcome to those of you who are here in the audience today, as I mentioned. I would also like to ask uh, unanimous consent that the gentleman from California, Mr. Lowenthal, be permitted to sit in this afternoon and be recognized after all other members of the subcommittee have been recognized for questions. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, today's hearing, I think, is particularly timely, not only because of yesterday's Advocacy Day celebrating and recognizing the importance of Vietnamese Americans as part of the greater fabric of this country, but also because the state of the U.S.-Vietnam relationship is at a critical juncture. Vietnam is a country that, over the course of the past two decades, has made great strides in reforming its economy and accelerating its growth. In 2018, Vietnam will be formally recognized as a market economy, and by 2020, it hopes to reach industrialized country status. This is tremendous, especially since many of us here in this room remember the war-torn country uh, it was some 38 years ago, uh, including especially uh, my colleague, our ranking member, uh, Mr. Felio Mavega, to my left, to, to your right, uh, who served uh, during uh, the Vietnam War there, and we thank him for his service to our country. In addition, the U.S. is now Vietnam's largest trading partner and one of its top foreign investors. And Vietnam's participation in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, most people refer to it as TPP, negotiations is considered a big step in recognizing Vietnam's growing influence in the Asia-Pacific region, even if it is becoming more and more uncertain whether Hanoi can meet the agreement standards. Nevertheless, economic relations seem to be uh, only one of the more, more important components driving the administration's efforts uh, to broaden engagement in, in other areas. Uh, it is unfortunate that USTR refused our invitation uh, to join today's hearing, uh, because trade is a key aspect of this bilateral relationship, and many of that office's ongoing efforts are contingent upon progress on other areas, notably human rights. Hopefully, our witnesses from the State Department can relay uh, any concerns that we express this afternoon. As we have witnessed Vietnam's economic role in Asia evolve, its overall strategic and geopolitical importance has grown uh, in parallel. Vietnam's interest in forming closer ties with the U.S. in response to China's assertiveness in the South China Sea has commenced a new chapter in U.S.-Vietnam relations. At this critical stage where the relationship faces an array of opportunities, there is also a long list of challenges that are hard to ignore, namely the entirety of Vietnam's human rights record. Credible reports from organizations here in Washington, international advocacy groups, and people inside Vietnam indicate that the human rights abuses in Vietnam are continuing, have broadened, and are probably even getting worse. Members of the subcommittee staff uh, visited Vietnam earlier this year to investigate the human rights conditions, among other things, uh, inside Vietnam, during which they heard directly from a variety of individuals who validated uh, those concerns about human rights. Just in the last few weeks, we have seen Vietnam's government crack down on dissent by arresting blogger uh, Chuyen Yui uh, Niot for allegedly abusing democratic freedoms uh, with acts against the state, beating and detaining numerous people, uh, attending a human rights uh, picnic on May 5th who gathered to peacefully discuss human rights issues at that park, detaining 20 individuals just this past weekend for protesting the recent ramming of a Vietnamese trawler by Chinese Navy vessels, harshly sentencing two young Vietnamese bloggers last month, and preventing blogger and RFC Google 2013 Netizen of the Year, uh, Hyun Naun Chen, from traveling to the U.S. Uh, these examples, I think, give us plenty of reasons to think that the number of religious leaders, bloggers, and politically active people being abused, harassed, detained, convicted, 
and oftentimes sent to jail for violations of Vietnam's authoritarian penal code are growing. So the question today is whether Vietnam is doing enough to warrant the current level of assistance and cooperation that it receives from the U.S. Uh, even the State Department's 2012 Human Rights Report paints a picture that this may not be acceptable. As the human rights condition in Vietnam deteriorates, enhancing security cooperation and assistance becomes problematic. Why, then, does the fiscal year 2014 State Department budget request for Vietnam increase the levels of IMET, that is International Military and Education Training, and FMF, which is Foreign Military Financing Assistance, while decreasing assistance in other areas? These increases need to be justified. Fundamentally, Vietnam disagrees with the basic definition of human rights and what it means to protect the basic rights of its people. So I consider it even ever more difficult to verify that U.S. taxpayer dollars are being appropriately utilized in these areas. I hope that today's witnesses will discuss the outcomes of the human rights dialogue held in April and what promises or commitments, if any, Vietnam made. At the same time, I hope that you can elaborate on how the administration is pressuring Vietnam to take action and detail what the administration plans to do if human rights abuses continue at the current rate. Lastly, I think it is important to emphasize that a successful and mutually beneficial U.S.-Vietnam relationship across all <laughs> issue areas is really what most of us here, I believe, want to see. Until Vietnam implements the proper reforms and demonstrates its commitment to upholding the basic rights of its citizens, it will be difficult to justify enhancing our relationship further. For example, if and when TPP negotiations reach a final agreement, it must be approved by Congress, and Vietnam's participation will likely face considerable scrutiny because of the magnitude of its human rights abuses. This is a message that Vietnam must understand. I know Mr. Philly Mavega has a number of constituents from the Close Up Foundation who are with us this afternoon, so I am going to grant him a couple of extra minutes for his statement. And following his statement, I will recognize uh, Chairman Royce for five minutes and Chairman Smith of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations also for five minutes. And following their remarks, we will recognize any additional members who wish to speak for one minute, and then we will proceed with our witnesses' uh, testimony and then questions from us. Uh, and then we will adjourn after all that. Um, I now yield to my friend uh, from American Samoa, uh, the distinguished uh, ranking member of this uh, committee, Eni Faleh Mavega, for making his opening remarks. 